Hey, Big Rob. Hey, what's up, Rock and Mike? How you doing, buddy? All right, man. How you doing? You sound good and chipper with everything that's going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got the reason I, I, I was a little late was because I was watching all the uh, the war coverage in Manhattan. Oh, yeah. What's going on? No, they just there's you could watch stuff on YouTube. People are live streaming. Oh, yeah. I watch, yeah. I watched them uh, throw a uh, break the windows at Michael Kors in uh, Rockefeller Center. They, they wrecked that place. And uh, they're just marching down towards, like, 59th Street, screaming and yelling, breaking shit. You know, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Let's uh, get away from all the politics, yes. all the burning, all the bullshit, and let's do what we do best. Let's uh, talk about uh, the Rock Show 77. Yep. And um, you're going to tell me today a little bit about a very famous, infamous, and a pretty crazy motherfucker. Yes, Mr. Uh, Little Richard, who sadly passed away uh, back in the beginning of May. Um, Yeah, I mean, he had an amazing life. He's one of the originators of rock and roll. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I even go far enough to say he's probably one of the greatest vocalists ever in rock and roll. Very distinctive voice. Everybody knew Little Richard, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was so famous. Like He was probably one of the few guys... That was probably on America Bandstein a few times. Yeah, he was, and uh, but I think uh, you know he outlived a lot of a lot of his contemporaries. So yeah, he was able to stay a, a superstar for a long time. Yeah, he he was around for a long, long time. Yep. So let's talk about this uh, this special uh, person and um and what's his place in rock and roll and um you know how he lived his life and uh, where do we start a story from? How, what do you well, got for me? It all starts in Macon, Georgia, okay? And he was born Richard Wayne Penniman. Penniman was his last name. Uh, December 5th, 1932. He was the third of 12 children to Leva May Penniman and Charles, they used to call him Bud Penniman. But Bud Penniman was a church deacon, but he was also a brick mason and a moonshine bootlegger and a nightclub owner. Wow. A little bit of hands and everything, right? He owned so, a club called the Tip In Inn. All right. And Leva May was a church going woman of the Macon Baptist Church in town. Uh, he started singing at a young age in church. Okay. He was made to go to church. And uh, the Penimans were very religious and often worshiped at uh, Pentecostal churches as well as Baptist churches. And, and wow. little, Richard, little Richard liked the Pentecostal services. He liked them best because there was live music and he was very gifted with a loud singing voice, even at a young age. And a lot of times it would get him in trouble in church because they said he was screaming and hollering. <laughs> oh, my God. He was screaming and hollering to the day they put him in the coffin. <laughs> I, I, I would think so. He probably was. They used to call him Warhawk in church. Oh, yeah. yeah hey, Mike, let me ask you a question. So this guy, his family was pretty well off. He, did he have any poverty? Was he poor? He was pretty well off. Oh, what? Well, Look, I mean, his father, his father did all that. You know, he was a, a bricklayer and, and he did a little side side shit with bootlegging. And, <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he owned the club, but he also had 12 kids to take care of. So I don't, oh my God. I don't know what kind of money they had. Probably not a lot. OK, but you got to remember, this was also, you know, kind of the Jim Crow South, you know, discrimination and everything was still in effect, segregation. So it could it, it, it was probably a. Uh, he had a happy childhood, but, you know, probably not very well off. All right. Pretty interesting so far. But he, I, I never realized he was one of 12. Yes. He was the third. Was he the only one that had got a career out of that? Were there any other, other family members that had any kind of career, even a gospel or anything else? Or it was uh, probably only no, him. Nothing like that. I believe two of his brothers uh, went into business with him later in life like to kind of control his record rights and stuff like that. You okay. Know, okay. But I, I don't think anybody else had a career. No. All right. So let me ask you. So this guy had seven decades of fucking music and he was right. also known as the innovator, the originator and the architect of rock and roll. Is that a true statement? Do you think this guy was the architect of rock and roll? I'd say he's one of a couple, but definitely, definitely, uh, probably one of the most important. 
Okay. Mike, who will you put up there in that category? Like uh, that's 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 a question that's you know very hard to to answer. Okay, uh, you know some people will say it's Elvis. Well, yes. I don't know if I really agree with that. Um, I like to think it's more like Little Richard or uh, even Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah, Jerry, will you will you consider like because um, <laughs> even Johnny Cash started with a little bit of rock and roll. Absolutely. That the Sun Records, you know, somebody basically mixed country music and blues, rhythm and blues. Okay. And came up with that. All right. And it, there was, it was happening in certain parts of the country, really, like in the South and a little bit in the middle of the country. Ike Turner, okay, wrote a song called Rocket 88 in like 19. 19- I think it's either like 49 or 50. Okay. And it's, you know, it's considered the first rock and roll song. If you ever heard it, you'd wow. be like, wow, I could see where Chuck Berry got his shit. Or, oh, you know, shit. Things like that. You know, you know, little Richard was doing something very original. He was, he was breaking, uh, you know, racial boundaries. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I'll go into some of it, like the, the crazy chaos of the shows. Okay, early on, I mean, you know, he was playing in front of white audiences. That was a no-no. Wow. Okay, in in certain regions of the country. And they couldn't stop it because he was loved that much. Wow. That's that's crazy. (laughs) It is. It is. So let's get back. Uh, He he was a kid of 12. What else do you got for me, Mike? Well, you know, he he was influenced by gospel music, obviously, with the church. Yeah. And... uh, People like Sister Rosetta, Brother Joe May, uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp, I mean, uh, Brother Joe May, uh, Mahalia Jackson. He loved all their music. And um, one time in uh, October of 1947, Sister Rosetta Tharp overheard him singing her songs. And it was at a performance that she was going to do at the Macon City Auditorium. So she heard him from the audience, like, you know, before she went on, uh, you know, singing some songs from the seats. And she just was moved by him. And she invited him to open her open up for that night. Wow. Okay, He was about 15 years old. OK. And she invited him onto onto the stage before she went on. And she actually paid him after the show, too. And this was something that, you know, I think he never realized he could do. OK. Actually make money from singing. So he was kind of like inspired to start singing professionally after that. But like I mentioned, Ike Turner, he saw Ike Turner play. Okay. And and play the piano and perform the song rocket 88. And that inspired him to play the piano. Wow. Yeah. So there's that, you know, he was, he was, you know, going to shows at a young age and kind of just like soaking it all in and, and, getting his influences. But by 1949, he would go on a traveling show. It was called Dr. Nubillo's Traveling Show. Okay. And Nubillo was a guy that um, he would wear capes. He would wear turbans on his head. And that was some, that would be something like the flashy look would be something that would influence him. And, you know, Little Richard would be like that his whole career. Uh, later in 47, the, uh, excuse me, 49, the 17-year-old uh, Little Richard would join up with Dr. Hudson's Medicine Show, okay? And he would perform, like, early R&B songs, uh, stuff by Louis Jordan, a song called Caldonia was a song he would do. Uh, and, and at that time, it's a little hard to understand it now, but at that time in the late 40s and very early 50s, R&B was, like, controversial, Okay. It was it was it was very it was it was black music yeah. also black okay uh, you know stores wouldn't carry the records only certain ones did uh, you might have to mail things mail mail order stuff things like that to get it uh, and you know the music used to be called race music and the lyrics were you know a little sexually suggestive and uh, it just wasn't something that was in the mainstream. So it was very underground. But there would be these traveling shows through the South. Were they like black shows? Were they all black yeah. artists? Black artists and black audiences only. Okay. All right. That's what he was doing. Okay. Uh, 
there used to be something called the Chitlin Circuit. All right. And the Chitlin Circuit <laughs> was, yeah, exactly what it was. You you would be eating soul food like Chitlins and and, in, and you'd be playing dive bars and clubs that were kind of, you know, a little seedy and, and, you know, in segregated areas for black audiences and black people only. That's it. Wow. And he, he had to do that a little bit early on. Now, R&B to his family was considered the devil's music. They wouldn't let him listen to it. But once he went out on his own as a 17 year old, well, he's a young guy. OK, he uh, he just do- you know dove right into it. Now, interestingly, is he used to do a show in drag. Holy shit. Yeah. He used to go <laughs> under the name Princess Levon. OK, and he would do a show in drag, playing piano and stuff. And in 1950, he joined Buster Brown's orchestra. And that's when he got the name Little Richard. OK, uh, he also did shows for them in and out of drag. You do you do a show dressed like a guy. They do another show dressed like a girl. Wow. And, you know, controversial stuff. Did he ever get in trouble for any of that? No, because that was all part of the scene. OK, it was it, it was like. Ah, it's 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 kind of hard to explain. This stuff was so underground that you could probably get away with stuff like that. Yeah, I okay? guess so. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, even, even even on, you know, in the 50s on TV, you'd have Milton Berle dressed in drag. OK, Milton Berle used to do a I forget the character's name, but it was a female character. Oh, yeah. Used, yeah you know, what? Used yeah. To do it show. but but he did it in a way like, you know, he'd be smoking a cigar when he yeah. But you know, with 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 uh, with Little Richard, I'm sure he dressed up real nice and drag. But now R and B was his favorite music at this point, and he had settled in Atlanta, and he would frequent like the city's clubs a lot. There was a place called the Royal Peacock, and a place called the Harlem Theater that was popular, and he would see artists, R and B guys like Roy Brown and Billy Wright. Now both of these artists were very flashy. And he would befriend Billy White and Bill, Bill, I'm sorry, Bill Wright, not White, Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. Uh, Bill Wright was uh, a, a kind of like a precursor to Little Richard in some ways. He used to wear makeup. OK, and he kind of taught Little Richard how to do like his hair, like a big ass pompadour haircut. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he, you know, he told him, he told him you need to grow a little pencil thin mustache, which he used to do. Yeah. And, uh, now, you know, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit more after, but, you know, at this point in his life, L- little Richard was gay. Yeah. He, he yeah, was definitely gay, right? At, at points in his life. Yeah. Cause I always, I always thought he was kind of flamboyant, you know. Well, you know, he 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 was very flamboyant, and what's interesting though, some of that was once he got popular. Okay, he would do that up a little bit more. He would play it up the flamboyancy, and the reason he had to do that was because when he was playing in front of white women in the audience white people and specifically white women if he came off in any way in those days that he was down with some of these girls he'd get fucking killed okay like if he was like you know like hey baby that kind of thing you get it not kill he probably would have got lynch well yeah okay in those days and uh so he probably played it up a little bit on stage just to protect his ass Wow. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I get, I get yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Bill Wright knew he, that Richard was very talented, and he put him in contact with a guy named uh, Zenas Sears. And Sears was a local DJ in Atlanta, and he let Richard, with Wright's band backing him, record some songs at the radio station he worked at. Now, those recordings ended up being heard by RCA Victor, Okay, that record label. And RCA Victor signed him to a contract for four singles. Okay, eight songs all together. And the first one was a blues ballad called Every Hour. And this was a hit. It was a hit uh, regionally in Georgia. Okay, in those years, you would have regional hits. And uh, 
it was actually a big hit in Macon where he was from, and his father had it on the jukebox at his club. So it was a you know a lucky break for him. Richard would then join up with uh, Perry Welch and his orchestra. Uh, that was at the uh, you know that was after the, the the single was doing well, and he would start playing clubs and army bases for like a hundred bucks a week. Yeah, but in in, in February of fifty two though he would leave RCA Victor because the rest of the records didn't do anything, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, and it was at this time also that tragedy would happen in Macon and his father would be killed, his father Bud. Uh, He would be killed in an altercation outside his club. So that was probably probably something, something that went wrong. Yeah, I don't know if he got shot or beat up or stabbed, but... He died outside the club, okay? And it was related to an altercation that was happening outside. And, Mike, let me ask you, how was the uh, music around this time in Atlanta? Was Atlanta, like, a little hotbed for certain acts? Um, well, you know, through the South, you had a lot of R&B acts. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, yeah, you know, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't on a national level, Rob. Okay. Okay, it was more of a regional thing. In other words, if you lived in Atlanta, Okay, you had a pretty vibrant music scene happening. It's just that the rest of the country didn't give a shit. Yeah, because it was just in Atlanta. That's all. It it was in Atlanta. Uh, you know, you had stuff in New Orleans going on. You know, through the South. Uh, and and if you were a fan of music, you'd know about it. But it wasn't really in the Billboard top twenty. You know, it wasn't pop music at all. Okay. Okay. Right now. At this time, uh, after his father's death, he would get a manager named Clint Bradley, okay? And shortly after that, he would relocate to Houston, Texas, and start a band called the Tempo Toppers. Houston was another spot that was, yeah, that was kind of a hotbed. And he would, because if you, if you set yourself up in Houston, you can get to the rest of the South pretty quick. You could get over to Atlanta, and you could also get to New Orleans. It's not far from, from New Orleans. So uh, he would often play Houston and New Orleans and Atlanta. Okay. And in February of 53, he would sign with another label. Okay. For a singles deal. Uh, a guy named Don Roby had a label called Peacock records. Now Roby was a big shot in R and B music. Okay. Uh, he signed a lot of bands. Uh, one guy he signed that was famous was a guy named Johnny Ace. Do you remember that song? Uh, um, what the hell was that song? Forever, my love. Yeah. Okay. Remember the movie Bad Lieutenant? Remember the movie where he's like naked and he's like, oh, he's all drunk and wasted. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's the song that song, played. That song's in the background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Johnny Ace, and then there was another guy named Johnny Otis who was very big, and they were both signed on Peacock. Now. Unfortunately, the singles he would record for Peacock didn't do well. They bombed. And his live shows, though, were becoming more popular. He was becoming a reputation as a great live act, but it wasn't translating into any money. And he felt that Roby owed him money. So one day he confronted him. And it was it was over this disagreement about money. And Roby knocked him out. Wow. Laid him out. Okay. And he would just get up and, and go back to Macon, Georgia, went back home. And uh, it was there that he met a famous R&B guy named Escarita. OK, now Escarita was a flamboyant piano player with a huge pompadour and sunglasses. OK, so he, he was almost like another precursor to Little Richard. Yeah, he Richard definitely had, sound like it with that name because it sounds like a woman's name almost. Yeah, it, it it did, and he and he would he would wear makeup too, okay. And he was one of these guys that played all over New Orleans and stuff, and you know, in this underground R and B scene, and he was very popular. I think he only had, I could be wrong, but I think he only had one album, but he was had a long career of touring. But he was, you know, he became friends with him and, and he was definitely an influence. Now, but he wasn't Hispanic or anything. That was just a stage name, right? No, I think he was black. OK, I think he was. Black. Yeah. Yeah. It was at this point, though, that the tempo toppers would be disbanded. Yeah. He started a new band called the Upsetters. 
And this band toured with, uh, under Clint Bradley's management, he would tour with uh, a guy named Little Johnny Taylor, very popular at the time. By early 55, though, a friend of Richard's named Lloyd Price. Now, you ever hear of Lloyd Price? Yes. He did Stagger Lee and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, he, he was good friends with Lloyd. And Lloyd loved Little Richard's music, his style. And he sent a demo to Specialty Records, the label he was on. All right. And at the time, he, he didn't, you know, Richard didn't hear back for a long time. That was in early 55. But by yeah. September of that year, Specialty got back to him. And it was specifically the owner, Art Rupi. OK. And he wanted to sign him. But he was still under the contract with Peacock. So he lent Little Richard the money to get out of his Peacock contract. He would he would buy his way out. And Rupi would connect him with producer Robert Bumps Blackwell. Yep. Okay. And he was a very important guy because he was a producer for Fats Domino. Okay. Uh, actually, let me back up a second. He wasn't actually a producer for, for, for Domino, but he would send him to New Orleans, okay, mm -hmm. to be to be with uh, the producers of, of, of Domino, of Fats Domino at the time. There was a place called J&M Studios in New Orleans. Yeah. And this was where uh, Fats recorded all his music. Um, basically... So, Mike, let me ask you, in a way, uh, mm -hmm. was um, was Little Rich your answer to, uh, for especially, like, to uh, compete against Ray Charles? Yeah. Uh, well, that's what they, that's what specialty records thought. Like, they would be he would be their answer to Ray Charles. But, you know, Richard didn't want to be Ray Charles. He wanted to be Fats Domino. He wanted to be Fats Domino, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, he related more with, with what Fats was doing than Ray Charles. Ray Charles was great, Yeah. okay? But he was a little, I guess he was a little too vanilla in a way for, for, for little Richard. You know, he wanted something with a little bit more of a punch. And Ray Charles, not all his music is like that. Um. So by going to New Orleans, that was a it was a big thing because he would be able to meet up with some of Fats Domino's session musicians. Uh, there was a drummer named Earl Palmer, a saxophonist named Lee Allen, uh, and they would all record. Okay, and 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 Blackwell would be down there record, you know, doing this uh, this producing. Okay, for uh, for Richard, and you know, for a while he he had this great backing band, but it really wasn't going anywhere. The recordings weren't being met with any interest, but with any, you know, they just, it just wasn't happening. And one day they went to this club called the do drop in and little Richard had this song in his head that he'd been working on, but he didn't tell them any, anything about it until they happened to be in the club that night. And it was the song tutti frutti. All right. And Blackwell thought, you know, this is a hit. This could be a hit. But the, the original lyrics to Tutti Frutti were dirty as hell. OK, <laughs> and there, was, there was no way you could release a song the way the way he wrote it. So they had a, a songwriter named Dorothy uh, Labostri. OK, and she would replace kind of some of the sexually suggestive lyrics with the lyrics we know now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and it was. Yeah. I mean, they had to do it. You couldn't release it the way it was. I would love to see exactly what it was. I wonder I what the know. hell. Yeah, I'm like saying what yeah. the hell it was. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. So, yeah, it's, it's, Mike, this guy was right. He was an instant hit then, right? Was he like... Well, yeah, hit? because they, they, they recorded that song in three takes. Wow. In September of 55, okay? They put it out in November as a single, and immediately it was a hit, okay? It got to number two on the R&B charts. Wow. And it actually crossed over into the pop charts, and got in America and got to number 21 and to number 29 in the UK. Wow, he even now, hit the UK. That's far he went. Is, is, were there a lot of black um, artists doing that hitting the UK also? Because at that let time. Me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There were no black people doing that in the UK. Okay. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the British fans. No, but I mean, I mean, artists from America were they very famous, like in the UK, like especially like black yeah, artists. Yeah, they would be, yeah, they would be bigger over there some of them and not just the black artists some of the the white rockabilly guys yeah. like uh, eddie cochran and gene vincent they would they were bigger in england than they ever were here okay and in rest of even france was another place like some of these guys 
had their careers extended, they would play over there. Jerry Lee Lewis was huge in England. Oh, yeah? Wow. Huge. Yeah, I mean, he was big here, too. He was big, yeah. Huge. So this guy had a great live show. He kept taking our albums. The albums never went anywhere. And finally, he got a hit with Tutti Frutti. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was putting out singles. He hadn't put out any albums yet, but it was just a few. I mean, yeah, he had like singles, but they never did yeah. anything into this. Is like the breakout, right? This is the yeah, one. Yeah, this was this was the big hit. He'd already been doing it for a few years, okay? Okay. But uh, you know, he would come out with Tutti Frutti, and then the next single in early '56 would be Long Tall Sally. That's a great now, song. That's, that's, a, great that's song. a great song. Now that that would be an even bigger hit. It would go to number one on the R and B charts, and it hit number thirteen on the Billboard charts. It would actually even go higher in the UK and go top ten. So is this when white people like start listening to him and he like pretty much crossed over without really crossing yes. over? Yeah, he did cross over. Okay. Okay. White people were listening to him. Okay. You gotta remember 50, 55, 56, you had Elvis, you had uh Jerry Lee Lewis, uh Buddy Holly would be there soon. Uh what else? Um Carl Perkins was kind of big. You had like you know, Johnny Cash, you had this new emerging sound, but then here you had this black guy screaming his fucking head off. <laughs> okay. And, and parents that were like a little afraid of say Elvis, you know, shaking his ass and everything. Now you just got this like sort of gay looking black guy screaming. Okay. I mean, when these people were on TV, parents were like flipping out, man. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to imagine it now, but it really was like a, a scary I, I, thing. I could totally see it back there. Like, parents just like, oh, my God, you listen to this guy? Yeah. Like, what is this? You know, it was like everything uh, that you taught your kids not to do, they did. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was that? like a little taboo almost. And, oh, it was very taboo. And in per- certain parts of the country, you know, it would be banned rock and roll. You couldn't have the music played. Okay, at that time, 55, 56. Um, one thing, though, is the backup band, the Upsetters that he had, he would rebuild them that year after the hit of Long Tall Sally. Uh, he added some uh, saxophonists, a guy named Clifford Gene Burks and Grady Gaines. He had a bass player named O.C. Basie Robinson and a guitarist named Nathaniel Buster Douglas. And Little Richard started touring across the United States. It was it was a big tour he did, and touring like I'm like I've been saying for black artists in those days, you know he would experience racism and discrimination. All right, in many southern venues, the white people were at the floor level, and to see him, but the blacks had to be up in the balconies. Okay, so. You know, yeah, many groups at the time that were promoting segregation, they tried to say Richard couldn't play in front of white people or in white venues. Yeah, because he was he, putting the races together. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's what they were afraid of. But he was too popular. Like I said earlier, he was making people too much money. He was too popular and, you know, too sure of a moneymaker, really. So he would break that glass ceiling for, for black artists and play places that black artists never could before. Okay. And his shows at the time were like off the hook nuts. All right. He would jump on top of the piano. <laughs> he, would, he would run, he would run off the stage and come out with like souvenirs and throw them into the audience. Sometimes he used to go into the audience. Okay. And you know, it was, it was crazy. And at one show in Baltimore, a place called, uh, the Royal Theater in June of 1956, the show would actually have to be stopped because women started throwing their underwear up at him on stage. <laughs> okay. And that actually, I, I didn't know this until I was doing my research, but I figured Tom Jones was probably the first person that ever happened to, <laughs> but it actually, it actually was Little Richard probably about 10, 15 years earlier. And was the, the people throwing, was a very mixed audience or just uh, white women and black women? Well, I would say in Baltimore in in 56, it was probably a black audience. OK. OK. But regardless, OK, they were throwing their fucking underwear at him. Nobody did that in the 50s. Yeah. You know, it was crazy. Um, also, shows sometimes would have to be stopped because people be trying to jump off the balconies to get to him. 
All right. <laughs> I mean, it was really, it was like mayhem. All right. And, it, imagine being a time machine and being able to go to one of those shows and it's like totally pandemonium. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was. It was like Beatlemania before the Beatles. Yeah. But uh, he would put out some more singles in 56 uh, that did very well. Slip it and slide in, rip it up, ready, Teddy, the girl can't help it, and Lucille. They were all released in 56, and they were big hits. Most now, of those auto songs are like hits. Yeah, Lucille, that's a, it's a great song. Um, now, <laughs> you talk about white audiences. Uh, you can't get any more vanilla yeah. than Pat Boone. And Pat Boone would actually record a version of Tutti Frutti. All right, at the same time. And it actually went top 20. It went a couple of wow. points higher than Little Richard's version. Yeah. But it's, you know, if you've ever heard it, it's just a total, you know, there's no screaming or nothing, you know. It's just like he's singing it. But uh, at that time, he also became friends with the DJ. Yeah, we Alex did a total Reed. show about him. And Yeah. Yeah, remember that? And, uh, you know, he would appear in two of Alan's. He was another weird movie. guy, Alan Free. He was like a freak, like Little Richard. So it totally yeah. makes sense that these guys came together. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, yeah, Free yeah. was an interesting <laughs> dude. We talked about that. So, uh, but he would, he would be in two of his rock and roll movies, one called Don't Knock the Rock and the other one called Mr. Rock and Roll. And uh, in the third film that was made called The Girl Can't Help It with Jane Mansfield, he would get a bigger singing role in that. That's a great movie, okay? And, he, you know, Little Richard's scenes in that movie are just unforgettable. Um, in 57, he would come out with his very first album, and it was called Here's Little Richard, and it would come out on Specialty Records in May of 57. Wow. It got to number 13 on the charts. Now, that's big, because in those days, albums didn't sell. OK, uh, in the 50s and early 60s, everything was based around the 45, the single. OK, so for someone to go out and buy the album, it was it was a big deal to get to number 13 was good. And uh, it was that same year that they would go on. He would go on tour with Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. OK, uh, wow. I believe that was to the UK. Now, yeah, now. uh Nope, I'm going to back up on that. Excuse me. That was actually, he went to Australia. That was another spot that R&B and Rockabilly would, you know, be very popular in those days. I guess because it's kind of like yeah. the UK in a way. It's the same same kind of culture in some ways. Uh, they, they were very big on Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent and Little Richard. So, but things were going to change. Okay. Yeah, you know he what gets, happens here, right? He started getting fame, right? Well, he gets oh, yeah. fame, but he gets religion. Okay. And, you know, this would be, this would happen to him more than once in his career where he would leave just, rock and roll and, his go, roots. and go back to his roots, which was gospel and, 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 and a ministry. Okay. Uh, he announced in the, in, in the middle of that tour in Australia that he was leaving rock and roll and starting a ministry. <laughs> all right. And what had happened was there was a plane yeah. that he was on on that trip that had mechanical difficulties and it, during the flight. And, you know, he was scared and he said he saw angels holding up the plane. Okay, wow. To save, to save him. So at the end of a performance in Sydney, Australia, he uh, told them that he was, you know, giving up this life he told the audience okay and uh later that night he would actually have uh, he thought it was a vision he he looked up in the sky and he yeah. saw this red fireball going across the sky up in space and everybody told him no richard that's sputnik the United States <laughs> just launched the sputnik one satellite. Yeah. but he but he didn't he didn't care he didn't care okay he took it as a sign from god that he had to repent and stop his crazy lifestyle, okay? And uh, Mike, you know when I read that, okay. I had to look at it twice because I, yeah. I couldn't believe that's why. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's hilarious, right? <laughs> but I mean, I think that he was probably looking at his life and and not happy with certain things. Okay, it might have been his sexuality. 
All right. I, I mean, I, I can only get that. But uh, I, I think that he, you know, felt going back to the church was yeah. the right thing to do. Um, also, on the way back, he, because he left 10 days early, um, he found out that his original flight, had he left when he should have, actually crashed oh, into the shit. Yeah, so he saw that as another sign from God as well. But he also he saw Sputnik. Right well, that was in, that was in Australia. He I saw Sputnik funny. and he thought it was God. Okay. But... <laughs> now, he would do a farewell concert, all right, because everybody was saying he was giving up music. He had to do a farewell show, and it would be at the Apollo in, uh, in New York City. And he did one more record uh, for specialty records as well. Now... Here was when he would join the, the ministry. He would enroll at the Oakwood College uh, Church of Theology in Huntsville, Alabama. And in late 58, he would start the Little Richard Evangelistic Team. And it was a, 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 a ministry team. He would preach. He would travel across the country. Um, and it was here that he met a secretary from Washington, D.C. named Ernestine Harvin, and they would wow. get married in July wow. of 59. It was the only time in his yeah. life he was ever married. All right. And they actually would adopt a son. So I believe but he it's only an has one son. son. You think an he would have son. sex yeah. with that woman? Well, what I heard is that they did. Okay. And he loved her, but he also admitted that they were, you know, they were oh. doing other things. Okay. You know, what, one thing that he admitted to, I think it's in his book. Um, he was very into like voyeurism. 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 That's when you just watch oh, people yeah. have sex. Yeah. So he was into that. Um, you know, later on in life, he would be into like orgies and, you know, cocaine. And, pray, and all kinds of stuff. Treat. That'd be kind <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even before that, even in the 60s, before that. Um, but, you know, during his preaching time, singing would never leave him entirely. And he would venture into gospel music eventually. OK. And he signed up with Mercury Records in uh, 1964. Uh, he would he would make a gospel album called King of the okay. Gospel Singers. <laughs> All right. Excuse me, that was, excuse me, that was in, yeah, that was actually in 1961, not 64, my mistake. Uh, but he would call, it was called King of the Gospel Singers, and it was produced by none wow. other than Quincy Jones. All right. And Quincy always said that, that Richard's vocals were the best of anyone he'd ever worked with. And that's... That's a big yeah, thing. He worked, work with, with, Michael he, worked, Jackson, he worked right? with so many people. Like not only Michael Jackson, like yeah. this is a who's who's of people that he, you know, that that <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. And he said it was, you know, he was his favorite vocalist. Now, gospel singer Mahalia Jackson did the liner notes on that album. And she said in the liner notes that Little Richard sang gospel the way it should be sung. So that was one of his heroes wow. in the liner notes family. Uh yeah. Now in sixty two um, it would be a year where Little Richard would kind of come back to the mainstream. And concert promoter Don Arden, who is Sharon Osbourne's father, in case you don't know, okay, uh, persuaded Little Richard to go on tour in Europe. And he convinced him that his albums wow. were still selling over there. They were selling well, you know, and Sam Cooke would be his opening act. So that was a pretty big and really imagine that you're getting Little Richie um, and Sam Cooke. That's huge. Yeah. Now you also in his band, he had a very yeah. young Billy Preston. Okay, so that's that was a big deal. Now the first night of the tour, Sam Cooke's flight got delayed and he couldn't make the show. That was the first night. So things weren't going well right off the bat. And Little Richard, for some reason, he thought the whole concert tour was going to be gospel uh oh okay so yeah so he comes out now he's going to be the only performer for the night because the opening act canceled okay and he comes out and he does his gospel songs and this isn't what the audience wanted to hear okay so the first night of the tour <laughs> they put the shit out of him 
in, in the UK. In the UK. They booed the shit out of him. And, you know, he, he took it well. He did the show, but they booed him because they just – they wanted to hit Tutti Frutti, and he was singing about God, okay? And the next night, though, would be better because Sam Cooke would perform, and Richard was watching him from the wings, and he was very impressed with him. Now, one thing about little Richard you got to know, if you didn't know already, is he was very competitive. No. Nobody was going to outdo him. Okay. So he wouldn't be outdone. And, and when Little Rich came out to do his part of the show, he started the show with like this crazy version of Long Tall Sally. And the the, the crowd went out. Yeah, that, the that, that, that was a very popular so he, song. He, yeah. And he did it like with a lot of power and stuff. And he hadn't performed it in a while, you know, so it was a big thing. But there was one show coming up in Mansfield, England. OK, where they had to end it early because fans rushed the stage. So he was getting some of that old response back now after he had disappeared so he loved for it. a few years. He loved it. He loved it. Now, on this UK tour, uh, Brian Epstein, who was the mm-hmm. manager of the Beatles before the Beatles were, were big there. OK, uh, he asked Don Arden if the Beatles could open up for Little Richie. And they did for a few dates on that tour. And it was during those shows that Little Richard would show them how to play his music because they used to do, I think, Long Tall Sally and, uh, you know, so, Good Golly. So he said, this is the way you do like it. That. This is the way you do it. And he actually took Paul McCartney to the side and gave him singing lessons. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, he taught him how to vocalize, you know, control his voice a little bit better. But by 1963, Richard had come back to the States and would record an album with his band, The Upsetters. But what they, they didn't put it under the Little Richard name. They used the name The World Famous Upsetters because he was kind of still interested in keeping his ministry and gospel music. So he and didn't he want to come back. He wanted to be like, all right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it was, it was destined to happen because in the fall of 63, he was asked to rescue a sagging tour featuring the Everly Brothers, Bo Diddley, and the Stones. Jesus Christ, he had Rolling to come and rescue it? Right. Yeah, that tour in 63 was not making any money. And they asked him to come on the tour, and he agreed, and the tour started making money. What well, was it about him that he was a, he was just a great stage performer, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a big presence, okay? It was a big presence on stage. Uh you got a good show out of that guy, especially the early years. You really did. I mean, the band was top notch and there's a great movie called, uh, called little Richard that came out in about yeah. 2000 that, that, you know, yeah, it showed a lot of the early years and stuff. It's worth watching. But Mike, you would think with that lineup, the Ebony brothers, Bo Diddy and Rolling Stone, they're not sending tickets. Nope. Well, yeah. this was 63, even the Be- Beatles, the Beatles yeah. hadn't even been on Ed Sullivan yet. Okay, so the Stones were even lesser known in '63. They were the they yeah. were the bottom of that bill. Bo Diddley was Bo Diddley was the, the you know the second. Everly Brothers were the first. Okay, so but you know this was those days when those bands were struggling and and you know having Little Richard be part of the tour. Let me ask you, what Everybody can you tell me out. about the TV show he did? Little Richard Spectacular. Anything special? Uh yeah he he had I'm trying to remember now when did he do that it was right when yeah sixty four yeah four hundred percent right okay. but yeah yeah he uh he did that it was right around the time that he came out with a a new song called Bama Lama Bama Lou all right and that song did well in the UK it went top twenty but it only went to number eighty two in the U S and I believe that show he did I think it was a British show. I'm pretty sure it became. It, it was a number American one hit. Thing. Like it got sixty thousand people. It was a hit right away. And I think that wasn't it. Something like the uh, the fans all wrote in and and demanded yeah, they did a total replay. Again. Yep. 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 They played yeah. it like they played it like twice. You know, in those days, there no. was no such thing as a repeat. You know, they didn't do that. So you know, but um, 
in that same year, he would sign up with VJ Records to release a comeback album. And it was called Little Richard's Back. Now, VJ was was a very popular label in the 50s. But by 64, it was kind of on its last legs. And it really didn't promote the album well. And it was also a time when music was changing because the Beatles and other British bands were kind of hogging all the airspace. And then you had, you know, soul artists were coming up and you had labels like Motown and Stax records. And then you kind of also had the rise yeah. of James Brown. So he kind of, he kind of didn't fit in any of that. Okay. He wasn't a Motown kind of guy. And he wasn't really a Stax kind of guy. If anything, he might have been more that, okay? Uh, because he would record some stuff that could have been Stax sounding. But he definitely wasn't James Brown. Yeah, that's so, uh, totally, totally different, different two different people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, here's a very interesting fact here. In November of 64, a very young Jimi Hendrix would join Little Richard's band. And the I was shocked by that, too. Okay. I never knew that. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you probably don't remember. You were probably lumped up. I remember you had that big sandwich at oh. Atlantic City that day. But when we did the show, when we did the show on Jimi Hendrix yeah, that's from, right. from the Hard Rock, we talked about this a little bit. But he would join um, as a full member on guitar, and Billy Preston was still in the band. And they would record a soul ballad called I Don't Know What You Got, But It's Got Me. And it went to number 12 on the R&B charts. But Hendrix and Little Richard were not a good mix. Okay, they would they would be clashing over the spotlight. All right, Little Richard would complain about Hendrix being late all the time. He'd be complaining about what he was wearing and the things he did on stage, and then Hendrix would complain that Little Richard <laughs> didn't want to pay him. <laughs> so he only last fifty dollars, like maybe about. Yeah, yeah, right. Why well, when he left, he actually owed him fifty bucks. But in July of 65, Jimmy would leave the band and join up with the Isley Brothers. So that's an interesting thing that he ended up yeah. you know, playing for Little Richard. You know? Well, Hendrix, pretty much uh, I think when Hendrix died, he was going to either join like Eric Clapton's band or something like that. Or, um... there, was, there was talk of like a super group. Yeah, or either John Mayo, but he was definitely out. Of, he was definitely, before he died, he was definitely going to, he wanted to, he didn't want to do his solo thing. He wanted out of his... um contract and i think he was gonna uh join like a, a another uh big singer you, you know when you when you think about some of these guys from the 60s that died like jim morris yeah. and jimmy hendrix or janice job and stuff like that you know you I, I, out of all of those people that died i always think about hendrix the most because you gotta wonder what he would have done going into the 70s and even 80s had he lived he you could know, have like also been a bus made, too, you know. He, he, he just don't know. Who knows? He could have. He could have turned into like, uh, you know, <laughs> Kenny Loggins kind of music or something. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> that would be awful if that had happened. Yeah, That's no, he died, right? that did, that <laughs> died. That's terrible. But... <laughs> Some people just have to die young. Jim Morrison, you can't. Yeah, it's weird. Old, you know, but yeah. But now the next two years uh, would be kind of tough on Little Richard. He was recording on different labels. He was putting out some badly produced albums and it was mostly forgettable stuff. But there would be a live album around that time called Little Richard's Greatest Hits Recorded Live that kind of, you know, brought him back a little bit and it sold well. But he was, again, he was back wow. on the Chitlin circuit, okay, because his albums really weren't selling. Um, the live album was making a little something, but, you know, he really couldn't get in with any, any, any good venues, all right? And it was an insult to him to be on that Chitlin circuit, but he did it. And uh, also what had happened was because he returned to rock and roll, the religious leaders that were in his corner before when he was doing his ministry and his gospel music, they blacklisted him. Okay. So, you know, you had these, like he had his fans in the gospel corner wow. in that genre. Okay. But they weren't going to buy his rock and roll records. They were told not to. All right. Now also too, like I said, the world was changing. 
black liberation uh, had kind of begun. All right. In the wake of like the Watts riots in California. And these people didn't accept him. OK, because these young black people at the time, they, they, they didn't accept him because he had played to all white audiences in his career. And, it, you know, there was this militant movement of the black liberation movement, this militant side to it. And they would kind of tell DJs, hey, don't play Little Richard's records. All right, he's like a, yeah. a, like a like an Uncle Tom or something, okay? And uh, that would be a problem for him. But he would get a new manager named Larry Williams that helped him out a lot. And he would convince Little Richard, listen, don't worry about recording. Just concentrate on your live shows because his live shows were still pretty damn good, all right? And by 68, the upset is he, he would get rid of them. They would be disbanded. And Williams started booking him in Las Vegas casinos and resorts. All right. So he started doing the strip. Okay. In Vegas. And these shows allowed him, these types of shows in these venues allowed him to really be even more flamboyant. Okay. And sometimes even more androgynous. If you see some of him in those days, heavy makeup on and his hair is big and you know, all that. And he would actually, at, at one point in April of 69, he would do um, a special show that the Monkees put on called 33 and the Third Revolutions Per Monkey. It was a TV special. And he would also play the Atlantic City Pop Festival. And Janis Joplin was on that. Wow. Show, and he stole the show from her. Yeah. And he would do it again in the Toronto Pop Festival and steal the show from the headliner, John Lennon. And that was the show where Alice <laughs> Cooper opened up and killed I the chicken. I remember. Okay. Now, think, 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 think about that. You have Alice Cooper killing a chicken. You have John Lennon as the headliner. And you have fucking Little Richard at the same show. And other bands. That's, but that's an amazing show. Three. Imagine that. Yeah, and, and, and Little Richard... Stole the show from John Lennon. That's probably why. You know, Yoko Ono, I believe, was there too as part of the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they knew she was coming on, right? <laughs> but, yeah. you know, and, and also was at this time that he went on Johnny Carson for the first time. He would go he on was the making around. He was show. Making like a little comeback. He kind of like, you know, was he was making, he was, right, he was making a little comeback. And because of that, Reprise Records would get interested in him and they would sign him in 1970 and release an album called The Real Thing, Real R-I-L-L, instead of Real. And he started to release uh, a little bit more socially conscious music. There was a song called Freedom Blues and that would be kind of a semi-hit that year. Um, in 72, he would work with the band Canned Heat, okay, on a single called The King of Rock and Roll, okay, which was coincidentally... The name yeah. of his 1971 album for Reprise. So it was kind of like he was being referred to as the king of rock and roll. And he was calling himself that. Um, he played a show with Chuck Berry at Wembley Arena and would tour extensively elsewhere as well. But between 73 and 77, his shows kind of suffered a little bit. OK, he was a little bit of the live shows were declining. And that's because he became alcoholic. And he was also dabbling in cocaine wow. and he even had some heroin use going on. But he was getting a little out of control. So by 77, he would quit rock and roll one more time and he would return back to evangelism. And he released another gospel album in 79 called God's Beautiful City. Now, he would continue down this road for a few more years. In 84, he would be kind of ripe for another comeback because what, what he did was He's filed this hundred. That's like a lot of money back then, and, against special especially in '84. That's a lot of money. Okay, well he, yeah, yeah, and Art Rupi, who owns Specialty, okay, and his publishing company Venice Music, and also uh, ATV was part of that, and they were, you know, he was accusing them of not paying his royalties after he left the label in '59. Now that lawsuit would be settled two years later in '86. But Michael Jackson was actually involved because he owned some of the rights to wow. Little Richard's music at the same time that he owed the Beatles. OK, but supposedly it's been said that 
he actually gave Little Richard. I can see. Roy- I can see Jackson giving him during that time. I can see. I can see Michael Jackson doing that. You know, but in '85, uh, the author Charles White would release uh, Little Richard's authorized biography. It was called The Quasar of Rock, The Life and Times of Little book? Richard. I've read this book a long time ago. And yeah, yeah, it really it really is. And I wish I had a copy of it. I, I think I got it out of the library like 20-something years ago. But uh, it, it was a very good read, I remember, and it kind of delved into some of the stuff that, you know, we didn't know back then about Little Richard, okay? He was actually pretty open. Um, it was at that point with the book and people were hearing about this lawsuit and, uh, you know, he was kind of back in the public eye a little bit and there was a renewed interest in him and he would be on talk shows. He would go on game shows, talk shows, and he would give a good performance in the movie down and out in Beverly Hills. Do you down remember and out scene Beverly Hills. in that movie? Yes. That was yes. Nick Nolte, Richard Dreyfus, and Bet. Okay, there's a scene in that movie where Dreyfus is like this rich guy uh, in his mansion. Yeah, I and think it is Bette Midler. Bette Midler's. Is Bette Midler his wife? I, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Bette Midler is his wife in the movie, and he goes into the other room in the mansion to like have sex with the maid. Okay, and he's having sex with the maid. But the dog in the house is always against him, and the dog sets off an alarm yeah. <laughs> on purpose. Okay, the, the the alarm goes off, and he has to stop being with the girl, and he runs out, and you see like the Beverly Hills Police Department ans- answering the call in force. There's a helicopter on top of the house. There's like a bunch of cars, guys with guns. You know, all because of a burglary alarm went off. Okay, and in the middle of it, all the commotion outside because Dreyfus comes out in his bathrobe. He's like, no, no, everything is good. Everything's good. All of a sudden you hear little Richard storming across the the, the front yard. Right. And it's him. And he's got like a Jerry curl and everything. right? <laughs> and and he's just screaming how like, you know, I'm a black man and I don't get this kind of respect if anyone tries to rob me. He goes, someone tried to break into my house two days ago. Nobody showed up. <laughs> he goes into this whole tirade. And then, like, they're just looking at him, right? And as he walks away, like, the dog chases him and, like, rips his robe. It's it like, is a classic. Like, I totally remember that, man. But That's it's such a classic a very, scene. That, that movie was great. That's, if you haven't seen yeah, that yeah. movie, it's a definite movie that you need to watch because it's so... Yeah, and I hadn't seen it in a long time, but it is a funny movie. Um, he would also do a, a song on the soundtrack of that movie called Great Gosh Almighty. That was like a hit in Europe. But in 89, he would do um, the preaching part for the song When Love Comes to Town. Yeah. The song that you two and B.B. King did together. Yeah. It's like the, there's like a preaching part. Well, I never knew that. Preaching. When Love Comes to that's Town, that was Rich, actually part Rich. of the decent uh, U2 song. Because yeah. I, really, I don't really care for you 2 Yeah, it was all right. No, me neither. But that was that wasn't too bad. BB King was good on it, um, and he would also do uh, uh, a song for Living Color. Okay, there was a, there was a song they did on their second album, Times Up. Uh, the song called Elvis is Dead. And yeah, it's like a spoken word rap. Wow. in the middle of that song, and that that's Little Richard. He would also be in hair metal, uh, the hair metal band Cinderella's video for the song Shelter Me. He has like a cameo. All right. And in 92, he would do some other things. He would he would do some children's records for Disney. Uh, He would continue that for a couple of years. He would do uh, for PBS and stuff. He would do children's things. And then in 94, you might remember this. He might. Can I tell you something? Tenet, Madison Square. I was there. (laughs) Do you remember this? He opened up and he sang. um, No shit. Really? uh, America the Beautiful. It was great. Oh yeah, I was there. I went to uh, yeah, that. was the really one there? where wow. Bret Hart. That was when uh, Bret Hart uh, lost to his brother Owen, and then um, and um, okay. and that was also where they had um the ladder match, and it was also the one.
Hello? Yeah, I, so I was there. I was at the garden. Yeah, I, I lost him. I was time. there. Go I ahead. saw him. It was a great show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, I you know what's funny? I, I still got that shirt. It doesn't fit that. me, but I got this shirt from that WrestleMania 10. No, I got the. It got all the matches. Doesn't have just say the day that it was, but I remember or? that that was the only time I ever seen little Richie, little Richard live, and he sang the "God Bless America," and it was great. And people, people lost their mind. But he did a great rendition. Wow, wow that's cool. Yeah, so yeah. that was the only time I actually oh, yeah. saw him. That voice, man, definitely. America the Beautiful. That's what he did. And he was. Yeah, I and what. what? One more you know who else opened up uh, WrestleMania was Ray I Charles at one point, too. He did uh, America the Beautiful. Also, for some reason, WrestleMania always opened up with America the Beautiful. It's a great song. They what, do the Star Spangled Banner, but then they do the America Spangled the Banner, Beautiful. They do that, right? They do both, yeah. They do both, right? Yeah. yeah. Now... Between the years 2000 and, and this year, 2020, his career would slow down a lot. But his celebrity status was really never higher. And he recorded a track for a Johnny Cash tribute album, okay, in the early 2000s. He also did a duet with Jerry Lee Lewis of the Beatles song, yeah. I Saw Her Standing There. That was for one of Jerry, Jerry Lee's albums. And uh, he would also perform at the Grammys in 2000. This guy never slowed down. Toby. He kept going. All right. And he never, he, no, he never slowed down at that. You know, 2008, wow. he was like 76 years old. Okay, so he, he, he was still going. But by 2010, um, you know, he would get some health problems yeah. and he had a sciatic nerve problem. And he also had a, a hip replacement that he had to do. Uh, he still would sometimes perform. All right. Uh, but there was one show in particular at the Pensacola, Florida State Fair in 2012. He was 79 wow. years old, and he did a whole 90-minute show. Yeah. Now, he also headlined the Viva Las Vegas Rockabilly Convention at the Orleans Hotel in 2013. I had tried no, to get but what you for that. Are you familiar with that Rockabilly thing they do every year? <laughs> Las Vegas, you definitely uh, you broke up Richard. there for a second. What would you say? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that Rockabilly convention, very cool. They do it at the Orleans Hotel. I had tried to get tickets for that, but it was gone in like two seconds. Uh, sadly, that same year, he would suffer a heart attack. OK. And then the next few years would be some ups and downs. Uh, in 2017, he would do a very long interview for the Christian yeah. TV uh, channel called Three Angels Broadcasting Network. And it was a very long uh like he's on stage with a panel wow. he's actually in a wheelchair and he's bald okay yeah so he's definitely looking his age uh and it was all the whole thing was about his his christian faith i actually watched it it was very interesting um sadly though and last month on the 9th of may 2020 wow. little richard would pass away uh, at his home in Tullahoma, Tennessee. Okay, he had complications related to bone cancer. It was a very short illness. He was only sick with it for about two months, but he, he had a away definitely long career. Like what they long say, was what seven decades? Yeah, and he made yeah. it to twenty yeah. twenty. Yeah. What about over that? Sixty years <laughs> that he, he was fantastic, back. man. Damn. Mike, you really yeah, brought it today for this fantastic. show, man. You got you had a lot of information. There was a lot of the, the Hendrix thing, the thing with Fat Domino, yeah. the you know the thing about the people that started him, the flamboyancy. You know what? And I, I and and I knew he was married once. I didn't even realize he had uh -huh. a kid with that woman. He, but it wasn't a kid; it was adopted. Yeah. You want, you want to hear a you want to hear a funny story? We got time, right? Okay. Uh, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters and Nirvana tells a story where he said in, a, in an interview in a magazine that he, you know, if there was any star he ever wanted to meet, it was Little Richie. And one day he said he was going through an airport somewhere and a guy came up to him and he said, oh, you're Dave Grohl. And, I, you know, I heard that, you know, you always wanted to meet Little Richie. 
And Whoa. the girl said, yeah. And he said, well, he's my dad. And he said he took him outside uh, in the airport, outside to the street, and there was a limo right there. And the kid went over to, wasn't a kid, he was probably an adult, really, uh, you know, went over to the to the limo and, and you know, little Richard, the, the window came down and the guy stuck his head in, and then he, he, you know, opened the door <laughs> and little Richard said, God bless you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> to Dave Grohl, you know, it's a great story. And, and yeah, one other thing, too, is, is, you know, he, his, his music transcended so many different genres okay give you a good example lemmy from motorhead okay now but they love little lemmy richie and, you know metal and the crazy music and yeah but lemmy said to the day he died that little richard was his favorite singer favorite rock and roll singer so you yeah, know, but it's funny like, there were a lot of everybody. guys there were a lot of guys legacy. like rock and roll like that that yeah. really listened to him in the beginning you know that Yeah, well, you know, that's what you had in those days. If you think about it, and it, you know, let me let me in his documentary goes into it, the Lemmy documentary, where he says, you know, really that's all there was. You had Little Richard, you had Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, eventually Buddy Holly a couple of years later. These guys were the originators, Johnny Cash, okay? Yeah, These, pretty much. And everything else was just your mother's music. <laughs> you know, there wasn't much to listen to. But, you know, Little Richard was the shit. And, he, you know, I, I went and, uh, God, I, I after he died, I pulled out of this anthology that I have. And he does, uh, it's a two-CD set. And he does wow. a version brown of Brown Sugar from the Stones. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How come you taste so good, right? It's like he's got this amazing backing band. And he's just screaming through the song. And I'm like, this is almost better than the fucking original. Yeah, you know, I could up, probably, you know what's funny? I could probably do that on, you'll love it. On, on Apple also, because I got the Apple, you know? It's on YouTube. All yeah. right, Mike. So thank you yep, for everything. Yep, so how out. can we get, oh, and let's tell people we started a rock page. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we started the uh, the rock show podcast group page okay the rock show podcast group page on facebook so everybody listening join up um i'm gonna put a lot of stuff up about the show the shows will be on there uh also uh, any announcements related to the show pictures uh the rocker mike song of the day i'm putting pictures up of things from my personal collection of stuff uh I'm trying to make it interesting uh, it's going to be and a reviews. little bit of everything. We're going to be doing reviews. Um, feel free to interact if you have anything. And you're right. Re record reviews I'm going to do every week. At least once or twice a week I'll review something. Uh, it's going to be fun. And I mean, I put it up a couple of days ago. And Yeah, it was good. It was be, quick. Like, I, we got I, like I sent it to a lot of people. I got to go ready. back so and hopefully, send them on because I think I'm doing uh, – We definitely that's definitely good. And I'll, and I'll start putting a lot of the yeah. shows there. If you can find the show, if you go on um, – on Facebook, we could probably put a link to, straight to the show, and you can listen to the show. And um, I'll put I'll put a few different. I'll put Apple. I'll put uh, um, and I put a different um. You know, cause people got different kind of uh, ways to listen to the podcast. So I put two, three different um links in the in the group dumped up. You know, so people can go there. And then yeah. there's always the YouTube right, the right. YouTube link that we have that um. Yeah. I've been just putting pictures. Soon you're gonna see our ugly mug. Right. It's always good to um, it's always good. So I I find some very interesting pictures sometimes <laughs> just doing that. Yeah, yeah, you do. You do a great job with that little slideshow. Um, one thing I'd like to mention real quick, a, a sad note is that um, uh, oh, Misfits I saw that drummer Joey Image passed away. Uh, I'd I'd like to dedicate this show to him. Uh, he lost his battle to cancer today. He was part of that lineup with Bobby Steele and Jerry Only and Glenn Danzig, which is probably the best lineup of the Misfits. Joey Image, yeah. rest in peace. Great drummer. Uh, yeah, definitely a great drummer. Forget you, man. Great drummer. Great drummer. 
So if you're looking for me, you can find me on Instagram, RockerMike212. You can find me on Twitter, RockerMike3. You can find me on Facebook under my name, Michael Baker. And make sure to check out the new Facebook group um, page. You can also find me on Instagram, page. Twitter, YouTube, uh, Facebook. And you can also find me on the uh, new um, Rock uh, rock Show um, page also. You can send us email. And um, if you got a show that you want us to do, yep. uh, just drop a link, you know, drop a message. Uh, Mike uh, really does a good job. I always play like the guy that asked the question and Mike always gave me some great answer. I was <laughs> one other thing too I want to say, if you go into the group page or you want to contact me on anything I just said, if you're in a band, let me you know, and it's something that you want me to, to discuss. If you if you got a single out or if you got something on SoundCloud or some MP3, anything with your band and you want me to check it out. Let me know. Send me the link or send it to me. Contact me on the group page or contact me on Instagram, whatever. Okay. I definitely want to, you know, if you're yeah. out there and you got some music, yeah. let me hear it. I'll promote it. <laughs> but we did, hey, hey, look good. what we if did you, to Joey sucks, Pinto. The guy people are talking about it. Like, he loves it. I think we need to invite him and do a show with him soon. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. No, yeah, but we yeah, could well, do a show. Have, like, we, we could call him, Chicago you know? to see him. Because he was, he was, he was actually a great guest, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're like we last fantastic. Time. So, uh, Mike, he was. What do he we was. do he here? Fantastic guest. We get lumped up. See you next week and have a good one. Well, we don't get drunk. <laughs>